Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Harold Schumacher to my Stephen Schumacher. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Justin, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm good, a little bit tired. It's a different vibe we've got going uh, in this episode, obviously, a bit later than we usually record, but I'm good. I'm excited because we've had a, an interesting game to, uh, to analyse. We certainly have. Thank you for that very basic and blank response to that just question. Just about my personality. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Justin is right, ladies and gentlemen. This is a reaction episode to Birmingham City v Leicester City from Monday night. Me and Justin are fresh off the back of that game finishing, so we're giving you some fresh reaction as it happens. How lucky are you? But... The, the, the whole plan along for this show was to react to Birmingham v Leicester. That was always the plan. But we've had a hijacking for this show as well because, obviously, we've had some news regarding the new Stoke manager. So we will talk about that also in this episode. So stay tuned for updates on who that could be if you haven't been paying attention <laughs> to the news. But welcome to the number one championship podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Oh, let's talk Birmingham v Leicester from Monday night. It finished Birmingham 2, Leicester City 3, Kin and Dewsbury Hall. And a brace from Steffi Mavadidi were the goal scorers for the Foxes to maintain their fantastic lead at the top of the championship. No Jamie Vardy here. So we were brutally denied Vardy v Rooney 2, which is annoying. That's whole narrative taken out of the equation instantly which I was very disappointed about however I think we were kind of you know we were rewarded instead Justin with one of the most bizarre goals we'll ever see at this level um, that first goal Birmingham have a corner a bit of pinball and Leicester smash it against their own post it bounces <laughs> out Leicester instantly go up the other end and score is that the most championship goal We'll ever see. Yeah, I was going to ask why it was bizarre, but I think Leicester smashing it against their own post and breaking from that uh, directly, almost directly, is is yeah, is quite a strange one. But I think it's more of a mistake from Birmingham to leave leave one man back. It's a tactical error considering they uh, well Leicester punished West Brom doing exactly the same thing, and well Birmingham punished twice for that same same aspect. As for bizarreness, uh, you know, surrounding other goals, it's definitely one of the, the strange ones. But I think it was probably more clear cut from a Leicester perspective than than it was bizarre. I think they were quite fortunate with the way it broke for. Mavadidi, I think it was. Um, it was two Leicester players. I can't remember who hmm. uh, broke who, who broke to initially, but you know it, it was it was a rapid counter attack. It was a brilliantly taken counter attack. But I think all the credit here has to go to the Leicester player who smashed it off their own post. I think it was James Justin. I think it was. It's, it's um, next level showboating, isn't it? Uh, it it's, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to say he did it on purpose. I don't want to say he meant it. But I would definitely go into the dressing room at half time saying, "You're welcome, lads. You're absolutely yeah. welcome." <laughs> um, but we talk about the counter-attack there from Leicester, Justin. When we think of Leicester, we think of patient possession football. But here, they showed they can also be brutal on the counter. I mean, they went from hitting their own post to scoring in 13 seconds, mm -hmm. which is insane. Kieran Dewsbury Hall, his goal came from a counter-attack as well. But I mean, Steffi Mavididi, he was a great example of why they are so good on the counter-attack. He got a brace here and he is absolutely electric when he's on form like this, isn't he? He's just a confident player. He's a confident player, loves the ball at his feet and as a supporter, you just cannot get enough of that. Time and time again, he wanted to go after... Um, is it Was it AU at right back? He wanted to go after him time and time again and it was, it was almost a repeat scenario um, getting into one-on-one -on -one situations he's just a really good player to watch and again going into the second half as well there was as several occasions I mean his goal came from it um, where he's cutting inside he's going to the byline he, he mixes it up and makes it so hard for the for any fullback in a division to, to really understand exactly where, what he's going to do next or where he's going to go but yeah he's got so much quality I mean even even when he took a dive in the first half when he got in between AU and uh, Bielik I thought that bit of skill was fantastic and it needed to be rewarded, not with a dive, essentially, because it, it, it was a little bit of a dive, but not, not to take anything away from his performance, he was scintillating. 
Yeah, and we have seen him do this on a few occasions this season now, haven't we? Just mm-hmm. have a game where every time he gets the ball, he makes something happen. Um, if I were going to criticise him somewhat, I think it's be- that sometimes he does have the odd game where he is a bit of a passenger. But when Leicester are on form, like they were against Birmingham, he is just frightening to play against. And look, I- I'll admit, when he came in, Leicester spent a fair bit of money on him. And you look at his numbers from his time in France last season, weren't anything extraordinary. Mm. I was looking at it thinking, why? Why were they spending this much money on a lad who wasn't particularly prolific in front of goal? His his underlying data wasn't anything outstanding. But on plenty of occasions this season, we have seen that he is a very, very frightening player, an exciting player and is looked worth all the money that they spent on him. Yeah, it's performances like this that remind you of the quality that he's got, and it reminds you of the quality that other players have got in this this Leicester City side. Um, They have spent a fair bit of money, but Harry Winks was, uh, during the game, controlling the tempo at times. When uh, when Leicester lost control of the game, it was because, you know, the play stopped going for Harry Winks. It's, it's, It's... you know, they, they spent a good deal of money, but they spent it on quality and you've got to praise it. Even Matt Hermerson, there was times where you could argue at this season that he didn't make the right decision, but there's a scenario in the second half where he could have easily played it out from the back, but he but he booted the ball into touch. Um, and again, it's just, just little moments like that that tell you that the team's evolving, the players are evolving, they're getting better, they're getting more streetwise. And I think that's going to help things um, as, as the season goes on because you can, you can make the argument that's not happened for them at, uh, on occasion this season. So it's four wins on the bounce now for Leicester. I'm repeating myself every week, but it continues to be the best start in championship history. And after Ipswich's draw at the weekend, Leicester are now three points clear at the top of the table. Possibly even more importantly, they're 13 points clear of third-placed Leicester. So promotion is looking very, very good for Enzo Maraska's boys, which will be no surprise to anyone. Uh, From a Birmingham perspective, though, just in... We have got to remember they're playing against top of the championship, possibly the best side we've ever seen at this level. However, this was very one-sided and Leicester should have won by more. It seemed like they were hardly trying after they scored the third goal. Uh, The second Birmingham goal came completely against the run of play. Gave them a bit of hope, but I never really fancied them to still get anything from the game. It's now eight points from an available 33 under Wayne Rooney. And it just often seems to be one step forward, two steps backwards with this Blues team under Rooney. Well, I said it in the previous episode, the winner of, uh, the winner of a Cardiff, it, it felt like it was a more of a, new, uh, a John Eustace performance where they, they were a lot more rigid. Um, they didn't enjoy as much possession um, and, they, and they looked sharp on the, on the counter at times as well. And there were occasions in this game where I was like, okay, well, I'm seeing something good. They pressed well at times in in, um, in the final third. They put Leicester in some awkward positions, but it wasn't sustained enough. It wasn't consistent enough, and ultimately it wasn't good enough throughout the 90 minutes. I was time and time again where Leicester were just able to run through the midfield. Um, it just looks like Christian Bielik and even Sunjic aren't the right pairing. They're just not mobile enough for me just, in, just, in that middle. They were under John Eustace. That's the thing. They were playing so well under but they, John yeah, Eustace. But they and now were, it just seems to have gone to shit. They were playing well, but they weren't pressing. So there wasn't space in behind. So they didn't have to rely so much on their legs to, um, to, to well, I guess, get back into shape. Um, it's, it's when they're playing in a rigid system, they excel. I mean, Bielik at Derby was surrounded by runners. He was never normally, especially um, post-injury, he wasn't, or both uh, post two ACL injuries, he wasn't um, sat in a, a, a double midfield pit of it. He was surrounded by runners, um, and that's I feel like that's a, a serious mistake from Rooney to to leave Billy because he's looking sloppier and sloppier, and that's the same with Birmingham City in general. They look sloppy with the ball, almost as sloppy as Rebecca Vardy's uh, defence in the Wagatha Christie trial. Yeah. Good throwback there, I like that. Um, <laughs> but you're right, Birmingham was so sloppy in possession in this game. I lost count of the number of times they lost the ball. And I'm following on from what you were saying, it is quite astonishing how much the performance levels of Birmingham's players have dropped since Rooney's come in. And Bielik's the one who stands out the most for me. He looks like the parody of the Bielik <laughs> we all know yeah. and love. Um, Lee Buchanan. Fantastic under Eustace, looks bang average under Rooney. Jay Stansfield has gone from one of the most exciting attacking players in the division to 
essentially a passenger. He cuts a lonely figure. Team. Yeah, he does cut yeah. a lonely figure in this team. I, he the, the number of times we saw under Eustace, him taking the ball and running at players, and now he just doesn't seem to do that as much. He just looks like the confidence has been drained out of him all of mm -hmm. a sudden. And they're, they're just a select few, but the performances have dropped overall. And Rooney has blamed the players in the recent past, but the turning point from where things have gone wrong under Birmingham is him being appointed mm -hmm. as manager. And I don't think that's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. He's he's tried to change things too too much too quickly. Um, I mean, we've said it in, in previous episodes, you, you try and do that, um, especially when a team likes a manager, they're playing well under a manager, and then you completely shift it and change it and want to play a completely different style of play. It's going to... Uh, I, I don't know. I'm trying to. It's a square peg round hole scenario. It's going against the grain. It's not going to be a smooth transition. You're going to find bumps, and unfortunately, Wayne Rooney's having that. There was time and time again where Dion Sanderson got the ball in this game, and oh, I don't want to say shit himself because that's a bit, a bit, a bit extreme. But he looked nervy with the ball at his feet. He's just not that type of player. Never has been. Um, so Rooney trying to persist with that, it just isn't going to work. He needs to. He needs to. <laughs> almost drop that front foot aspect um, play the way Eustace was playing um, I know it's very easy for me to say this but that's that's unfortunately the formula that needs to really that really needs to deploy to, to transition into what he wants I think yeah but I don't really know what he wants that's the thing because mm. I've seen Birmingham under Wayne Rooney hoof it up to Lukas Jokovic for the majority of the game and that didn't work and then here it looked like they were trying to be a bit more passing through the lines and getting into the Leicester players' faces. And that didn't look very convincing either. So I don't really get what the plan is under Rooney. It doesn't seem like there's a good idea of what the plan is going to be in the long term. And that's why I am quite worried about the direction that this Birmingham team in general is heading in. Uh, final point on this game, Justin. You were tickled by a line oh from Mark God. Schwarzer, who was a pundit <laughs> for this game. How about you tell the class about that particular line? Unbelievable shade thrown from Mark Schwarzer. That was so subtle. And I was absolutely... From a man who can't really talk himself. <laughs> exactly. Will point exactly. Out. The words he said in the uh, halftime analysis was um, if Rooney had uh, Rooney would be pulling his hair out whatever he's got left of it I was just like <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> just, so... he's like I, in his defence what he's probably done is he, he said that line without thinking about it and then it suddenly clicked halfway Ooh. through oh hang on a sec <laughs> bit harsh that was his inner marks going oh no mate that's that's not right <laughs> sorry that's a, really offensive to Australians <laughs> I didn't mean that, Mike. Uh, Justin, let's take a quick break. After that, we'll talk about the seemingly incoming manager at Stoke City. Welcome back to the Second Tier podcast. So, if you haven't seen the news from the past 24 hours or so, it's been reported on Monday night by multiple sources that Plymouth boss Stephen Schumacher is set to become the new Stoke manager. Compensation is said to have been agreed and a contract is being finalised. Now, this comes just a day after we said, <laughs> why would he go to Stoke? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Justin, why is Stephen Schumacher going to Stoke? The only plausible thing I can think of is quite close to Horton Towers, isn't it? So you can get yourself a Merlin annual pass. Good point. And you've got unlimited visits to Alton Towers, haven't you? And you don't have to travel that far. And there's not much in the way of theme parks down in the uh, down the old Devon, is there? So that's a big I swing. Know, to be honest, you wouldn't know. I don't know much about the theme parks of uh, Devonshire. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, there is the big sheep. If anyone's frequented that, it's a good it's a good laugh. But that's quite North Devon. Anyway, in all seriousness, though, mm. um, if you ignored what's happened over the last five years, Stoke is it. It is a good prospect, isn't it? You've got good bones. It's a financially stable club. Owners pour money into the squad, and when you can get the good time going, history does tell you it's a very good place to be. I think as well, he's also a manager that's he plays a different style of play to the to the others that have been before him. Guy Rowett, Nathan Jones, Michael O'Neill, Alex Neil. Um, they all sit on the pragmatic end of the football spectrum, don't they? And this squad is perhaps crying out for a manager who has a different way of thinking in terms of this style. So I think Stephen Schumacher will probably be ambitiously going in and going, I can change this, much like several managers before him have said that. So I think on that side of it, 
it's a, it's a good squad. But Soka has been a graveyard for managers, so on that perspective, I do wonder why he fancies it. Yeah, well, I am one of those people who is also thinking why he fancies it. Um, I'm very surprised by this. Now, I think as football fans, we often forget about the financial side of things. For Schumacher himself, he'll be getting a big pay rise to go to Stoke. I imagine it's the sort of money which will set him and his family up for life. And we shouldn't criticise him for taking that. And I imagine the majority of us would do the same thing in his situation. However... I think this is a bad career move because, look, Stephen Schumacher's a very talented young manager, but the Stoke job is brutal. It's taken several talented managers, chewed them up and spat them back out. It's a club seemingly not going anywhere fast. And that's why I'm quite surprised by this move. I think, again, just to be a bit facetious with that, the managers who have been before him have got good jobs after that or have done well in their jobs after Stoke City. Gary Rower obviously excelled at Millwall up until this season. Nathan Jones got uh, Luton into playoff promotion contention before Rob Edwards carried them over the line. Michael O'Neill got his gig back at Northern Ireland and I mean Alex Neal's still fresh so we wait for him to get the uh, Chelsea or Manchester City job whenever that comes up because as I say managers do tend to do better after Stoke City so it's a bit of a win-win I think for Steven Schumacher to play the facetious side of things. I'm not sure Justin because you think about it in terms of his reputation at the moment his stock is really high and if he fails at Stoke that will you know it will be a big blow on yeah. things for him. Yeah. Um, I mean, I said at the weekend, Plymouth will be in the Premier League before Stoke are, as far as I'm concerned. I massively stand by that. And that's because Plymouth are a club on the up. Yeah. Stoke seems to be going in the other direction. And I would say there's a good chance Stephen Schumacher will be out of a job this time next year. Because turning around this ship at Stoke is a huge, thankless task. And I don't know how they do it. The thing is, as well with Schumacher, and perhaps I'll be accused of revisionism, with this point but I think it's a fair one of course he's done a brilliant job at Plymouth but how much of that has been down to their recruitment and the club being extremely well run because mm. I would say a lot of it is down to that yeah having a good I mean you look at Kieran McKenna and Ipswich having a well run club with a good recruitment team behind the scenes does go a long long way we, I mean we saw Daniel Farker excel at Norwich under the same circumstances up until went a bit tits up a few years later but you get my point um, and, it, and it does help and I think Stoke are moving more so in that direction with Jared Dublin okay the recruitment was a bit haphazard in the summer but they recruited um, with an attacking mindset at their disposal and Alex Neal just isn't the right fit I think Stephen Schumacher is probably a closer profile fit for this squad than, than Alex Neal Michael O'Neill or any of the other previous managers that have been in charge um, so again he might be going into that thinking I can turn this around that being said, the thing that he's turning around is the Evergreen ship in the Suez Canal. Stoke City are a difficult ship to turn around. Um, and Justin, it's Justin, pause for a sec. <laughs> that is the greatest metaphor you've ever done. I'm so proud of you. That, thank you. I, I, I've done some good ones over the past few years as well. A lot of baking references, but I'll take that. Um, but my point is, Stoke are a very difficult ship to turn around. It's going to take a very talented captain, boat reference, to turn mm. that ship around and, and, and Schumacher is that so why not go in with this fresh mindset I, I do think he's, he's a young uh, bright manager he's shown this season that he, he can adapt his Plymouth side because they've gone from playing Justin, with wing Justin, backs to playing let four me, at the let back me, hang on quiet let me take you back <laughs> to just over a year ago were you not saying a similar thing about Alex Neal uh, I might have been a little bit more sceptical with Alex Neal I don't know. Were you not saying the same thing about Michael O'Neill? Oh, you're going back years now. Maybe. Exactly. We, we have said this all before. And I think Stephen Schumacher has done a fantastic job at Plymouth. I think he's a great, talented young coach. But can he turn around Stoke City, who are the ship in the Suez Canal? I, I got my doubts, I've got to say. But I, I, I don't. I, I rate Schumacher really highly, and I uh, mean, Justin, Justin, I rate Schumacher as well. But this is this has been an absolute graveyard, as it you has. say. It has, but there's got to be at some point. They can't carry on like this, otherwise there'll be a League One club. 
Um, there's got to be some point where a trend gets booked, and I think Schumacher is that 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 book of the trend, uh, very eloquently put by me. But again, you, you get my point. Um, and I think they, you know, I look at Lee Carsley, who was also linked with the job, and I think that's a fantastic link. And I think that's a, the, the, the way that Stoke needs to go. They need to get a young, bright manager with a who wants to play an open, fast attacking style of football that doesn't hold itself back because the managers that they've had so far have been pragmatic and they've been scared of really unleashing this Stoke side. And I think Schumacher won't be. And we've seen his Plymouth side, they do not give a shit. They attack, 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 attack. They will keep going. And I think if Schumacher can instill that mentality in his Stoke team, I think he can unlock the potential that the squad's got. We'll have to wait and see. Um, just in a bit of an impromptu question, and we are still quite fresh to this news, so I won't expect you to give me an, a name, but Plymouth are, of course, seemingly looking for a new manager. So what should the new Plymouth boss, assuming this deal all goes through safe and sound, who should they be looking for or what should they be looking for? It's a difficult one with Plymouth, isn't it? Because obviously they employed Stephen Schumacher off the back of him being with Ryan Lowe and now it's going to be a fresh start, a completely fresh start for the, for the club for the first time since, what, 2017, 2018, whenever Ryan Lowe was originally appointed. Um, so they, they've not been in this situation before and obviously we've not had to analyse them in this situation before but again I think going for a young bright manager who doesn't necessarily play a front foot attacking style of football you know I don't I hate to do it because it's the Alan Kerbishley factor isn't it it's a bit of a cliche but John Eustace I'm not saying John Eustace should get the Plymouth job but having a young manager who can come in and, and work with the resources that he's got and excel in the, with the resources that he's got but also might be a little bit more disciplined in how he deploys his team, that might get more out of this Plymouth side, especially in those away games. So I'm not saying he's will be a better manager than Steven Schumacher, but they might unlock a little bit more from this squad. So a young manager who might be a little bit more defensive minded than perhaps Steven Schumacher was, I think is the type of manager they should go for. I think a young coach has got to be the put is got to be, you know, the priority. Um, and just kind of carrying on the good feel factor around the club it would be a massive shame if they get someone in and the appointment's completely wrong and it undoes all the hard work that they've done from the past couple of years so I'd like to see that continue um, Plymouth are best on the front foot mm -hmm. so I would prefer it if they went for you know a, a forward thinking attack minded manager um, whether they went for someone a bit more disciplined I don't think that would hurt so I'd be interested to see who they go for. What I will say for sure is this. I think this is one of the best jobs which will be available all season. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for any coach. If in a strange turn of events, every single manager got sacked by every single club in the championship and I had my free choice of every <laughs> club in the league, I probably would choose Plymouth. Now, people may say that's an outlandish claim, but I think the reason I say that is because it's a club massively on the up, but also there's not as much pressure as there would be at, say, a Leicester, Leeds, a Southampton, those kind of clubs. So I think you've got a clean slate here to work and mould a club into your image, and you've got fantastic recruitment. You've got one of the best recruitment teams behind you at this level. Um, a club which is very very smart in the way that it does things so whoever comes in i w will be licking their lips at the opportunity to take on this plymouth team and if they get the appointment right this could be the manager who takes them to the premier league in the long term that's a long way down the line because i think it's going to be a few years before we actually see that happen but if they get this appointment right then it's it's gonna take plymouth to the next level mm -hmm. um, and whoever does come in has got a fantastic opportunity to, you know, not only enhance their own reputation, but also do a fantastic job at a fantastic club. Yeah, grow with the football club. I'm a bit disappointed you've not asked me about who I'd take over if every if every club was managerless. Go on. Whatever club gets me the most compensation for when I inevitably get sacked. <laughs> Stoke. <laughs> That's the answer we like to hear. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a reaction episode to not only the Birmingham v Leicester game from Monday night, but also the pending move of Stephen Schumacher from Plymouth to Stoke City. So you can expect that 
probably to be wrapped up in the coming 24 hours or so. Um, We'll next be back with you on Thursday when we'll be revealing our halfway team of the season. I am so excited to reveal this to you, dear listener. So you've got that to look forward to on Thursday. So we'll see you then, shall we? This has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening.